Does God exist? Are science and faith enemies? Your host for this series was an atheist who became a believer in God through his studies in science. Here is public high school teacher John Clayton. Some of you may wonder what a discussion of UFOs, ancient astronauts, the Bermuda Triangle, the Loch Ness Monster, and God has to do with a series of presentations that has connections with how we can know there's a God and how we can answer challenges to the questions of our relationship to God. But this is really a pretty important question. And it has mostly to do with the question of, of what kind of a world do we live in? Do we live in a world full of ghosts and goblins and demons and little green men that run around manipulating us and controlling us and causing us to do things that of our own free volition we wouldn't do? You know, all you have to do is to go through a grocery store line and you can see all kinds of headlines that suggest that somehow aliens are interacting with human beings, that ancient astronauts have dramatically affected the course of human history. And you also see all kinds of suggestions that history and even biblical history is connected. So you see headlines like, was Jesus Christ (laughs) E.T.? In other words, did Jesus do the things he did not because he was the Son of God, because he was an alien from somewhere else and people just didn't understand the things that he did? It's also important to realize that we have the question of actual sightings and the challenges that have to do with, are we really being visited by beings from other places in space? And I'd like to try and deal with these two subjects in somewhat different ways. The first question, are we being affected by ancient astronauts, by aliens from outer space, as far as the course of human history is concerned? And is there evidence that the earth has been systematically visited and controlled by beings from outside our galaxy, perhaps, or certainly with outside our solar system? See, there's a tendency to misunderstand evidence. Some of you perhaps know Johnny Hart, who is a fantastically talented cartoonist who has lots of spiritual messages in the things that he presents, but also does his own share of debunking. And way back in 1976, he had a series that I think beautifully starts our thinking here. It's uh, one of his more famous B.C. series. B.C. comes along one day and he sees a big rock up on top of a hill. He looks over the cliff down below, he sees some more rocks down below that are just like the ones on top. So B.C. has a really neat idea. He goes over to the rock on the top of the hill and he carves a face on it. He shinnies down the rope. He goes over to the rocks on the bottom of the hill. And he carves identical faces on the rocks at the bottom of the hill. Now about that, this time, his buddy comes along and says, what is this? And B.C. says, a million years from now, they'll blow their brains trying to figure out how we got the big dude up on the cliff. (laughs) Now the important thing to understand here is, but something like that is, is not only a reasonable suggestion, but we know, in fact, that things like this have happened. And some of you may remember a book called Chariot of the Gods, which later became a movie. There was a television series. It was written by a man by the name of Eric Von Donneken. And what he proposed was that there was all kinds of proofs that alien civilizations have systematically visited the earth. And the kind of thing that he did was, if you haven't seen this, that he went to places like Nazca in South America, and he he showed landing strips that he said were places where the aliens had landed and taken off in their space vehicles. Near these, there were beautiful hieroglyphics drawn on the ground, pictures which he said were demonstrations that people from outer space had put marks on the ground that couldn't have been done by people on the ground so they could locate their runways. You know, right away you have questions to think about with something like that. For instance, uh, if an alien can navigate all over the galaxy, do they need a war eagle painted on the ground to find the runway? Another example of the kind of thing that Von Donneken presents to us is he takes us to Egypt and he, he shows us the pyramids. And he says, now there's absolutely no way that anybody could have put these huge rocks up and made these monstrous structures. And he also tries to suggest to us that there's some kind of alien intelligence that control the dimensions here because he says, okay, if you multiply the perimeter of the pyramid by its altitude, you get a multiple of the distance to the sun. Now, in this type of thing, 
you have to raise the question of what about the people that were there? You know, you don't build a pyramid in your backyard without somebody seeing it. Did they explain how these were erected? And the answer is, yeah, we know how those were erected. We know that they used ramps. We know that they used simple machines. And what Vedonikin apparently didn't know at the time was that when the pyramids were built, they were faced with white marble. They might have looked something like this in the morning sun. Now, you remember the little calculation of multiplying the perimeter by the altitude and getting the distance to the sun. If you're missing 15% of the rocks, what does that do to that calculation? He tries to use the Bible and other manuscripts like it. But for instance, he uses Ezekiel. And when he presents Ezekiel, he presents it in a rather interesting way. Because what he says is that, that there were life-like beings, that there were four creatures that looked like men. Well, that could be interpreted as, as astronauts. He, he says that the thing was like wheels. Okay, flying saucer. Fire came from within it. A rocket exhaust. And everywhere the thing went, the creatures went. Well, that sounds like a UFO. But if you'll actually read the first three verses of Ezekiel, what you'll see is that the writer says he was among the captives by the river of Shebar, and he saw visions of God. Now, if you look up the word vision, it means dream, a vision. And if you go over to the 10th and 11th chapter, an angel tells you what he saw and why he saw it. I would suggest to you the only way you can find a UFO in Ezekiel is not to read it. And so you have all of these types of presentations by Von Donegan and others who use the same kind of techniques. He takes us to Easter Island. And he shows these huge granitic type statues standing, looking out over the ocean in Easter Island. He says, now, these are monuments to the aliens that created man and all these things here upon the earth. I actually was able to be in the Smithsonian one time in small, one of the smallest statues on Easter Island. And this one weighed about eight and a half tons, but there are some of them on Easter Island that weigh as much as 50 tons. And so Von Donneken will make a statement like, well, you know, a modern American stone derrick couldn't pick these things up and drop them in the ground like that, which is true. But again, what happens is the people who make these types of claims don't realize that there are other people that have written explanations and documented how these statues were erected. In this particular case, way, way back, over 50 years ago, there was a book called Aku Aku, The Secrets of Easter Island, which is written by Thor Heyerdahl, the same guy who sailed the Kontiki expedition. And in that book, he explains how these statues were carved and how they were transported on wooden sleds and how they were levered up to pedestals. I would encourage you to get the book and read it. So you see, the problem with the ancient astronaut hypothesis is that the people presenting it either are not aware or do not present the studies that have clearly answered easy solutions to questions about a evidence of ancient astronauts that shows that there have not been these kinds of punctuations in the history of man. Man was not created by aliens from other space that were doing some kind of an experiment or trying to fight some kind of a war. But there's another type of presentation that is made, and that is the kind of idea that says that, that UFOs are all around us and that aliens are manipulating and controlling things here upon the earth. And there's been dozens of science fiction stories, books, films that present this. Now, I think it's important to understand a couple of things. Number one, the Bible does not say that this is the only place where God has seen fit to create life. We've tried to demonstrate that from a probability standpoint, you cannot talk about life being an accident. But if there is intelligent creation elsewhere, then the beans are going to be there. And even skeptics and atheists have recognized this. So it's not suggested here, and I don't want anybody watching this to say, well, Clayton said there's no such thing as life in space. No, I'm not saying that. The Bible doesn't say that. And there were people back in the old days that said man would never fly, based upon the same kinds of assumptions. But what I am saying to you is that so far there is absolutely no evidence that UFOs have been visiting the earth or that humans have been controlled by alien intelligence. 
And there particularly is no evidence that people are being systematically abducted and carried away into alien zoos for some reason. And all UFO sightings have a relatively easy physical explanation of one type or another. Let let me just show you a couple of these. I do need to say to you right here that one of our problems in making this kind of presentation is copyright. What I would love to do is to take the top 80 UFO photographs, which I have in my files, and explain them all to you, which I believe I can do. But unfortunately, with copyright restrictions, we can't do that. So I sort of have to show you what I can do without using the actual photographs. But let me show you a UFO. What I want you to do is to stare at the dot in the center of this red triangle. Now just stare at the dot in the center of the triangle. And don't take your eye off of it while I'm talking. And there's nothing satanic or evil going on here. What I'm going to just explain to you is how your eyes work. Now, as you stare at the dot in the center of the triangle, I want to explain to you that your eyes have three kinds of color receptors. They have red-sensitive color receptors, they have blue-sensitive color receptors, and they have green-sensitive color receptors, three color receptors. White is a mixture of red and green and blue. What's interesting is, though, that these receptors only work for about 15 or 20 seconds, and then they quit working. Now, you've been looking at this red triangle on that screen for more than 20 seconds right now, which means you don't see it. Now, some of you are saying, you're crazy, I still see it. No, you don't. Your brain remembers it's there, but there is no signal going from your color cones to your, to your brain. You're not actually seeing it. I'll prove it to you. Keep your eye on the dot. Do not take your eye off the dot. Do you see a blue-green triangle on the screen? I think if the room's pretty dark and if you have normal color vision, you'll see a blue-green triangle on that screen. It's not there. There's no blue-green triangle on that screen. That's a perfectly white screen with a dot in the center of it. You'll still see a blue-green triangle? (laughs) I think most of you realize that it's not a permanent fixture. You're not going to see a blue-green triangle the rest of your life, but do you understand what happened? I said you have three kinds of color receptors, red, green, and blue. I said those color receptors only work for about 15 or 20 seconds, and then they shut off, probably to protect the eyes from burning out. So when I switched the picture, the thinking part of your brain said to your eyes, what do you see? The blue color cone shot back an answer. They said, we're excited, we're getting blue. The green color cone shot back an answer. They said, we're excited, we're getting green. But the reds couldn't shoot back an answer to your brain. And if you take red out of white, what's left? Yeah. Blue and green. So you saw a blue-green triangle that doesn't exist. You know, there have actually been cases where people have reported UFOs that we're quite sure were image reversals of this type. And probably you're not seeing it anymore because your color cones have recovered. But let's do it again. And and what I want to do here is I want to show you how complex this can get. So here's another picture for you to stare at. This time, stare at the cross in the center of the circle. And while you do that, let's figure out ahead of time what's going to happen. Now, you already know what's going to happen where the red is. Where the red is, you're going to see a blue-green pie wedge. Where the green is, I'm wearing out the green color cones in your eye. That means the red and the blue cones are resting. Red and blue, when mixed, are magenta. You're sort of a purplish-violetish color. You're going to see magenta where the green pie wedge is. Where the blue is, I'm wearing out the blue color cones in your eye. That means the red and the green cones are resting. Red and green, when mixed, are yellow. You're going to see yellow where the blue is. Now, where the yellow is, I'm wearing out the yellow color cones in your eye, but you don't have any yellow cones. Yellow is a mixture of red and green. So I'm wearing out the red cones, and I'm wearing out the green cones where the yellow is. So what's left? Yeah, blue. So you're going to see blue where the yellow is, yellow where the blue is, magenta where the green is, blue green where the red is. Keep your eye on the cross. Do not take your eye off the cross. Isn't that amazing? And I might ask you, how many colors do you see? And most of you are going to say, I see four colors. Just what you said. Yeah, if you have normal vision, everything's working right. That's what will happen. But if you've had surgery on your eyes in the last year or two, a cataract surgery, 
I don't know why, but for some reason this seems to affect this. It doesn't work very well. And some of the males in the room are probably saying, I don't see it. Well, about 40% of all men are colorblind to at least one color. And you see, lots of times in demonstrations of this type, what happens is that people don't see the same thing even though they do see the same thing. And how many times does that happen in UFO sightings? So the first point that I think needs to be made about UFOs is that many times there are visual problems like this that cause the difficulties that we're talking about. Let me show you another kind of problem. 40% of all males are colorblind to at least one color. Now that doesn't mean that they are even aware of it because it may only be a weakness towards the color. You know, when I do lectures and I'm presenting these things with a large audience, I'll have people hold up their hands how many people it didn't work for. And the people that didn't see it are almost usually men. And there can be two reasons for that. Either they don't follow instructions, <laughs> which I can't do much about, or they have a weakness or a colorblindness that they may not even be aware of. But the point is that lots of times when we have sightings of UFOs, it can be caused by visual problems. It can also be caused by another type of problem. I'm going to put a picture up here on the screen. We're going to cover the whole screen with it. And I want you to make a snap judgment about the blues that you see in this diagram. Are the blues above and below exactly the same shade of blue, or are they different? And I'm going to snap the picture, and then you say out loud to the people around you what you think it is. Okay, here we go. Boom. There's the picture. Probably most of you said different. But if you keep looking at it, they're not different, are they? If you keep looking at it, you'll see the two blues are the same. What tends to mislead you? Well, it's the background. The yellow makes you interpret the blue too lightly in its area, and the black makes you interpret the blue too darkly in its area. You want to know why not everybody understands the Bible the same way? <laughs> same problem background. If you don't get rid of your background, you don't come to truth in anything. There have been cases where clouds have been moving in front of a dust storm and people thought they were looking at UFOs. There have been cases where all kinds of weather conditions have produced clouds that are very, very different. Clouds different, perhaps, than people have seen before. Background can be a major influence. And then there's the question of deliberate hoax. Take a look at this picture. Actually, this isn't even a picture. One of my students in the high school I taught him was in the dark room, and he spilled some Cracker Jack on a piece of photographic paper. And for whatever reason, he put a plastic toy UFO on top of the paper after spilling the Cracker Jack and flashed the enlarger, and this is what he got. How easy is it to fake a UFO picture? Or for that matter, how easy is it to fake an actual UFO? In Passac, New Jersey some years ago, two graduate students were home on spring vacation and decided to have a little fun. They took a 12-inch metal dinner plate, welded a clothesline wheel on it, and stretched a wire across the downtown area in Passac, New Jersey. And during the rush hour, they sailed this thing across the street. Traffic was backed up every direction as people got out and looked at this thing because they couldn't see the wires. And this actually made the front page in papers all over the country. What was interesting was that these two guys didn't tell anybody what they had done for about eight days. And during that eight, those eight days, there were over a thousand UFO reports made to the police, where previously there hadn't been any. Many times, hoaxes, tricks. And some of us as college students used to enjoy playing jokes on the local police by putting phosphorus on rags and floating them up with helium balloons and stuff like that. The second problem that we have is that there's a lot of people out there that have found out they can make money by making claims about UFOs or aliens or other devices. And so people have a vested interest because they can sell books, they can sell pictures, they can make a ton of money. We have encyclopedia companies that have made fortunes by putting out large volumes of material, dealing with things that for the most part were already pretty well understood. And yet people will still buy them and they can make a great deal of money with them. The third problem Another cause of UFO sightings is natural objects. Some years ago, there was a raft of sightings of UFOs around the 10th of August. Well, astronomers weren't surprised. This happens every year. 
Because what happens is we get what is called a boloid shower. A boloid is a large hunk of rock that enters the Earth's atmosphere from outer space. They can be white, they can be yellow, they can be green, they can light up the sky like daylight. And they travel at incredible rates of speed. But the result of that is that if people don't understand the natural phenomena that they're looking at, they may think they're looking at a UFO. And there are actually thousands of cases like that. Everything from Venus to Boloids to situations where there have been atmospheric disturbances. I suggest to you that the town drunk is not a reliable witness. And so many times the people making the observations are not people that have trustworthy backgrounds. If they have had long drug addiction, if they have other things that have affected their psychological stability, this will affect what they have seen. We have people who perhaps are prone to using imagination to interpret things in an alien way. The picture you're looking at right now was sent by somebody, and I don't know whether they were serious about it or not, but who said they saw an angel. Well, do you see what looks like might be an angel in the middle of the picture? I suggest to you it's just a natural cloud formation. Look at this picture and tell me what you're looking at. Are you looking at a man and two dogs or something else? Look at it carefully. Have you decided? You know, when I show this to kids, they say, yeah, oh, dummy, what are you talking about? They're man and two dogs. Well, look carefully at the shadows. You see, the dog on the left is not a dog. It's a piece of cardboard. The dog on the right is a dog. And if you look at the shadows, you can see that. Because just like the man has some shadows, the dog to our right, his left, have some shadows. Now, a trained observer looking at that probably immediately recognized that the one on the left was a cutout and the one on the right was a real dog. But most of us don't have that kind of training. Here's another illustration. This man, a friend of mine, lives near Lake Powell, saw this very strange aircraft traveling at an incredible rate of speed up the Colorado River. He said it was nothing like any airplane he'd ever seen and... It didn't make a sound. Well, I wasn't too surprised at this because one of the interesting things about Lake Powell is it's near a very high security research Air Force facility that's not far from there. And they fly up the Colorado River because the nature of the air causes the sound to be refracted up, which makes it very hard for anybody to spy on what they're doing with their aircraft. So, yes, you're going to see aircraft of that type. And there are very obvious structured test vehicles that look like UFOs. The point of my discussion here is that we do not live in a strange world. We live in a wonderful world, but not a strange world, not a world that is controlled by paradoxes and aliens from outer space that manipulate us and control us. We are not going to be able to justify what we do and the things that we engage ourselves in on the basis that some power beyond us took us over and caused us to do them. And you can take virtually any claim, and if you will use the three things that we have talked about, if you look for vested interest, if you'll be careful about observations, if you look at the credibility of the witness, you can search it out and see whether or not it is valid or not, and you'll find it isn't. Let's take a couple more very quick examples. The Bermuda Triangle. Thousands of planes, millions of ships disappearing in a small region of the Caribbean, right? <laughs> no, not right. What's your first question? Well, I would suggest to you is the question of witness. Is there a vested interest here? Yeah. I mean, this thing started with a book that made the guy rich that wrote it. A man by the name of Burlitz, dealing with the, with the Bermuda Triangle. And it's important to understand that when you start looking at the tabloid use of this and look at the facts, it doesn't stand up. Look at the size of the Bermuda Triangle. How many airplanes have been lost in that area? Well, a significant number. Now let's move over to Mexico, a much smaller area. Let's move to the Gulf of Alaska, a very much smaller area. How many planes have been lost there? More than in the whole Bermuda Triangle. The suggestion that there's something strange and wonderful going on here or something strange and, and disastrous going on here is not supported by the facts. And as a matter of fact, the oldest charter airline in the world operates out of Paradise Island in the Bahamas. They have flown literally thousands of flights to Fort Lauderdale, to Bermuda, to the Dominican Republic. They've never lost a plane. They've never had a strange event. 
Some years ago, the number one preferred route of airline pilots was from New York to Puerto Rico to San Juan, right through the center of the triangle. There's nothing mysterious about this. There's been no evidence that anything strange is going on. There have been a number of hoaxes. There have been a few tragic accidents like the Marine Corps squadron that got lost. But the facts say there's nothing strange occurring here. And this is a picture of something I think most of you have heard about. Again, I can't show you the actual photographs because of copyright problems, but, but this is a representation of the Loch Ness Monster of Nessie. Let me ask you, what do you think this is a drawing of? Yeah, it's an elephant swimming across a lake. Had there ever been elephants in Inverness, the town near Loch Ness? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, there is at least one case where the elephant escaped. And they found the elephant on the other side of the lake. <laughs> Any reasonable suggestions of how it got there? And as a matter of fact, the guy that took the picture is not exactly what you might call a credible witness. And there have been all kinds of new evidence that suggests that, in fact, he was not someone that you could trust to produce a valid picture. But is there a vested interest? Do you know that Nessie brings $25 million a year into the Inverness economy? When I was in Scotland, I didn't meet one single local person who thought there was anything there. And they were all amazed that Americans were gullible enough to believe that there was. And what was really funny was that the last or week or so I was there, there was a group of Norwegians who have invented a monster named Selma. And they had come over to Scotland to see how the Scots had marketed Nessie so that the Norwegians could get American tourists to come over and see their monster. <laughs> I think we've got a reputation for gullibility. Well, let's look at one last example. You believe in ghosts? There's a picture of a ghost. The famous Wendy ghost. Well, some of you have probably already figured this out, haven't you? My daughter Wendy, when she was about 10 years old, was given a camera for her birthday. That's what she wanted. We, we gave her one of those little things with a cube on the top of it. And she also was given a gerbil. So she decided her first picture with a new camera was going to be of a gerbil. So she held her hand up with the gerbil sitting in the crotch of her hand, and with the camera, like maybe 10 inches away, she popped the flash. I bet that gerbil was blinking for a week. Well, actually, I don't know whether the gerbils blink or not, but the point is, when I show you that, I think you can see that that's in fact what it is. But you know, I was at a camp one time, and I put this picture up out of focus and started telling the kids a ghost story, and I actually had some people getting upset because they thought it was real. We need to be careful to investigate carefully claims that are made. And I would suggest to you that the Bible warns us about not getting involved in sorcery, not getting involved in witchcraft, not getting involved in things that invite the wrong type of people to influence our decisions in the way that we conduct ourselves. We need to understand that our relationship to God needs to be governed by looking at his word and by realizing that we are in control of what we do and that we can make logical good choices unaffected by alien intelligence or some other force beyond our capacity to resist. We can, in fact, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Does God Exist is an educational program which attempts to provide evidence that man can logically believe in God and that the Christian system presented in the New Testament is the best option for successful living. We offer materials free and on loan. Contact us by mail, fax, or email for a catalog to request materials or just to ask questions. Does God exist may be the most important question you will ever ask.